Good morning. Just want to make sure I am loud and clear. And thumbs up. Good, good, good. Scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, uh, 1 to 13. He left there and returned to his hometown. His disciples came along on the Sabbath. He gave a lecture in the meeting place and he stole the show, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden? To get such ability. But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling and they never got any further. Jesus told them, a prophet has little honor in his hometown. Among his relatives on the streets, he played as a child. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. He laid hands on a few sick people and healed them, and that's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit of the other villages teaching. And Jesus called the 12 to him and he sent them out in pairs and he gave them authority and power to deal with the evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think about your needs. Don't take a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeal for funds, keep it simple. And no luxury ends. Get a modest place and be content there until you leave. If you're not welcomed, not listened to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different, right and left. They sent the demons packing. They brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies and healing their spirits. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. So this is a scripture reading taken from uh, Peterson's uh, paraphrase, The Message. Um, normally, I would be reading from the NIV, but I'm sure you've recognized it's the text of Jesus returning to his hometown, Nazareth, and can anything good come from Nazareth? And then he sends up the 12 on their first mission. So before I, I preach this morning, I, I'd like to pray and because you are uh, uh, music people, I want to I want to sing a psalm with you. And the first time we'll sing it, we'll learn it. The second time we sing it, we'll get it. And the third time we sing it, it will be a prayer. It's the lectio divina. It's like when you need to water your pot of impatience that have become a floater. The first bit of water runs off, the second bit of water creates a little bit of room for it to absorb, and the third soaking it gets in. So you'll help me. But. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that
So come, Holy Spirit, come and have your way with us this day. We are comforted that where two or three are gathered, you are here. We envision that you have been here waiting for us, anticipating who would be here this morning, keeping watch over those who aren't, that your word is alive and active and wants to speak to each of us in its own way. Word of God, would you speak? Holy Spirit, have your way. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and the ongoing work of our hands be acceptable and pleasing to you. Amen. Have you ever felt like you were holding your breath, trying to make it through the next hour, the day, or the week? Have you ever wondered if somebody's going to give you that glass of water that you're just hoping you could have a sip of? Thank you, Mary. Holding your breath, waiting that next hour, that next day, that next week, bracing for the other shoe to drop. I look to you, heaven-dwelling God. I look for your help. The psalmist laments, we've been kicked enough. We've been kicked when we're already down, and that's a common turn of, turn of phrase, isn't it? Kicked when we're down. It indicates that there's this unfair fight, that we've already been down means that we haven't even had a chance to get up and recover from that first blow before the second one's delivered. And in the gospel text today, Jesus returns to his hometown, and the locals scoff. Isn't he that carpenter's son, they can't see him as anything more than one of them. The reputation as the ghetto of the region was well known. Nothing good can come from Nazareth. Who did he think he was? And the message says they tripped over what little they knew about him, and they fell sprawling, and they never got any further. And they took offense at him. Really, Father, you want me to return to Nazareth? just to be mocked and ridiculed. And scripture tells us, I love this, scripture tells us that Jesus was amazed by their stubbornness and their lack of faith. He impressed Jesus. <laughs> so much so that he couldn't do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people. And I wonder if Jesus held his breath and found himself looking heavenward and saying, what, what's the plan? How can this be? I wish we could have more of a glimpse of how that really made Jesus feel. I mean, this was his home. These were the streets he played in, the synagogue, the market, the families, the faces he knew, and the faces who knew him as Mary and Joseph's son. As children, our home, and by extension, our community, is the first place we come to know belonging. It's like returning 20 years later to your elementary school and walking the halls and realizing that the coat hooks weren't really that high. And though you remember them inches above your head when you see how small the chairs are and the desks and the toilets, you must reconcile that what you're seeing in your head with the memory of these giant rooms, coat hooks and big desks, the school didn't change. We did we outgrew the place. Mark writes, they tripped over what little they knew about him and they fell sprawling. They never got any further. They didn't change. Jesus did. He wasn't just Joseph's son. He was Jesus, the light of the world. It was time to move on. He didn't belong there anymore. So Jesus gathers his disciples and he pray, prepares them for their first mission trip. Go in pairs. Take nothing with you. You don't need anything except your faith. It's interesting that after leaving Nazareth, where the ministry was blocked because of who Jesus was, Jesus responds by releasing his disciples into ministry because of who they were. They went with no extra supplies, no luxuries, no advanced bookings or itinerary. Jesus encouraged them you don't need anything but your faith. 
your presence is the ministry. Don't take offense if some do not receive you. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. I've often wondered if this Jesus assignment was as adventurous and as exciting as I first imagined it to be. In my 20s, I'd be like, oh, radical, so cool. In my 50s, where's my air mattress? I need a bathroom. Not as exciting. Scripture states they hit the road, preaching with joyful urgency that life can be radically different. Right and left, they sent demons packing. They brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies and healing their spirits. It does sound like they had no troubles at all. It's the highlight reel. But why then did Jesus warn them about what to do when they were ignored or unwelcomed? Why take them to Nazareth and have them witness, sit front and center to all the rejection he endured? I believe that we have lived long enough to know that woven into all the highlight reels of our lives, our wins, our joys, our successes, and what we find meaningful is a thread of suffering. It's unique in the way that it can color our world, shape our lives, and stir our memories. Sometimes suffering causes us to re-examine our faith. Sometimes we hold on tighter. Sometimes suffering motivates us into meaning-making so it doesn't feel so random and pointless. Sometimes suffering pulls us towards God or pushes us out into the wilderness. Life without suffering is not an option. Life without faith is. Suffering without faith is despair. I've listened to decades of people sharing their life stories with me, and I know that hope is central to the highlights in people's lives. Amidst their suffering, people want to share the good news, the celebrations that broke through their suffering. I imagine that suffering was assumed on that first missions trip. And the report that we read in scripture was the highlight reel of all the times they were encouraged in their faith. They saw the power of God to radically transform people's lives. They saw how God showed up and answered their prayers and provided for them. Ministry is not like that. And if it was, there'd be way more ministers and congregations. During the pandemic, I joined a 10-week webinar series hosted by Hospice Palliative Care Ontario. The series was titled Complicated Grief and Trauma in the Midst of COVID. Fun. Our educator's name was Eugene DeFore. He's a certified compassion fatigue educator, as well as a bereavement specialist. He was fantastic. He normalized our grief around the many changes and losses we all experienced during COVID. However, I don't think that grief has an expiry date on it. I think we're still carrying the impact of loss from the pandemic and nothing really has returned to normal. Just thinking about our churches, most have not recovered to their pre-pandemic attendance and hope is waning. It's becoming clear parishioners are not coming back and change is all around and we can't return to the time and place that it felt like home. And for many of us, we are grieving. We miss our church the way it used to be. We miss our people and robust communities that shared in the workload of meaningful work. Change is one of the most unrecognized causes of deep grief. And when we are grieving, we can feel foggy, and angry, confused, hard to concentrate. We can have weepy days or indulgent days Days where we feel okay and days when we ask, what's the point? Grief can make us feel more anxious about the unknowns and hypervigilant and holding our breath. Remember washing your groceries during COVID? All of this causes fatigue. If you're a small congregation trying to determine direction while holding the place together and holding on to your faith and paying the bills, 
you're likely very tired. Eugene told a story about being on the ground with the frontline workers in New York City the day of 9-11, the week following. He was working with the team that brought their dogs for rescue and recovery. He watched these German shepherds dig and dig and dig through three and four stories high of rubble. He asked the handlers how the dogs are able to keep doing this work. And they said that every two hours, they put the dogs in the van, and then they dig a hole in the rubble, and they place a fireman or some volunteer in the hole, and then they have a tarp that has a pattern of rubble on it and rocks, and then they put rubble over top of the tarp. They place some debris over it, and then they set the dogs loose. They said, at huge sites like this, or the earthquakes, it's important for the dogs to experience success every two hours. Without it, they will become despondent and distracted and unfocused on their work. They cannot function without the hope of success. If a dog handling team knows what is needed to care for their dogs, how much more so do we need to pay attention to our hope in the midst of rubble that we ourselves are digging through? We need to find little pockets of hope often, and we need to share them with each other. My experience has been that in the midst of rubble, the Holy Spirit finds us. In the midst of all God, all of it, God breaks in, giving us just what we need, our pockets of hope to encourage, to sustain, to motivate, and to reassure. It's those breakthrough moments of grace, a phone call, or during dark days, a songbird at your window, or one of a friend who just thought to reach out. It's the word of truth found in scripture or song that reminds you again, God is good. So what makes your highlight real? as disciples? What helps you to hold on to each other? And how has your suffering and your faith persuaded you to hope? In the movie Titanic, those in the lifeboats floated in safe waters and watched with horror as the unsinkable ship disappeared into the Atlantic. Many boats stayed away for fear of those drowning in the water would overwhelm the life drafts. Whether it's true or not, in the movie, one boat went towards those who were drowning, despite the unknowns. Our faith tells us this is not how our story ends. We know that hope is the lifeline of our faith. So may you hold tight today to hope. May you reach out and share your pocket of hope with another. Reflect on what would make your highlight real as you have followed Jesus. What has encouraged you and kept you going despite the suffering and the unknowns? And would you be willing to share one of those highlights with a friend today? Would you consider that it may be a lifeline to another person who's pleading, mercy, God, mercy? Your hope may be the answer to someone's prayer who's been waiting and holding their breath and longing for words of mercy. Hope is contagious. It anchors us sustains us, and helps us to carry on, though we cannot see the road ahead. And so I leave with you the beautiful prayer written by Thomas Merton. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me, and I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from you, the desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen.